live from the Oracle Conference Center in Redwood Shores, California. It's The Cube at the Next Generation Engineered Systems launch event. Brought to you by headline sponsor, Oracle. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Silicon Valley. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the suit and the noise. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante, my co-host, our next guest, Mike Workman, Senior Vice President of Oracle Storage. Uh, welcome back to theCUBE, really appreciate seeing you here. Um, you Larry's, gonna, Larry's gonna be talking about engineering systems about on stage at one o'clock here. Um, yep. Storage is a big part of that. Yes, um, it is. And it's, but in a platform, it's not a pure play storage kind of approach. It's got to be integrated. And what's the big, big thing today for you guys? What are you guys announcing? Uh, we're announcing a, a lot of different, in fact, it's a, a pretty extensive <laughs> content uh, a rich uh, announcement. There's a lot of different products in there and I, I won't go over all of them, but the FS1 is a, is a critical piece of, of, the, of the puzzle there. Um, there's a core of the data center. There's sort of your, your compute and your storage platform. FS1 is that. You'll see uh, Larry uh, doing some announcements around that area. And then you'll see uh, a weaving in of the uh, various uh, engineered systems, database appliance, uh, et cetera. And I, w I don't want to steal Larry <laughs> Larry's thunder, but um, it, as if anyone could, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, seriously, um, there's a, a very wide range of products. The FS1 plays into it because at the core of the data center is compute and store. So okay. everybody talks about next gen, right? Next gen this, 2.0. Where, what is next gen today? I mean, obviously there's a big flash component. You're talking about you know, integrated systems or engineered systems. What, what makes something next gen these days? Th that's a good question. And I think it's uh, a part of what keeps us all alive is figuring yeah. that out, right? And it's like either trying to anticipate it or trying to um, get ahead of it, you know? Yeah. Um, today, uh, for me, it's, there's a transition going on. Building a flash storage system, what we're finding today with customers is fascinating. <laughs> they buy an all flash array from Oracle and they put it in the data center and their, their infrastructure doesn't hold up. So, you know, the infrastructure in data centers was designed around HDD centric storage systems. It really was. So, in, in some sense, the industry is trying to catch up with the capabilities and the technologies that, that uh, you know, vendors can, can supply. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it, it's, a, it's a normal game, right? That pretty soon they'll get complacent with it and they'll complain it's not fast enough. <laughs> right, it's more data, <laughs> more so complex apps. and This is the way it works, right? I mean, you know, one day the 10 megabytes was a lot on a PC and then we have the, a gigabyte and all of a sudden it's not enough because, uh, it, it, or, or it's too much for a while until the apps catch up and start using it and demanding more. And this is sort of the, the stair step that we take in this industry. And so next gen, uh, you know, the, the cheaper storage gets and the, the more CPU horsepower that you have and the faster the networks, people come up with applications that challenge all of that. So then we go the next step and provide better infrastructure, people out, outfit it, and et cetera. And it's just a stair step, I think I see it's it It's pretty the time. amazing industry, isn't it? We double capacity every 18 months, we cut cost in half, and it's and never enough. And it's not enough. good enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, we have, so we have a question from the crowd. Any news on the Solaris zones or containers, but then I was asked, is that storage containers? And then it, the comment says, Oracle Database 12C is all about containers. What about the storage domains and the flash storage system? Are those important? As data isolations and security concerns increases, is containerization with flash storage becoming critical? Is that what that C stands for? I thought it was cloud, it's containers, right? <laughs> <laughs> containers are all the rage. We have an That's engagement it. container, Docker's got you know, cloud containers. Containers are essentially not a new concept, but it's all the rage. But talk about that specific point with the flash system. Okay, John. Um, there's, you, you asked, you, there's a lot of stuff in that. Uh, I'll try to make a, a, a brief. Yes. So Just, is yeah. it, yes. It's <laughs> yeah. Next, Next question. <laughs> Next question. Yeah. Uh, so uh, seriously, the 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 idea is um, that with with containers or uh, data centers the way they are today, that people want to have control over what I would call storage domains. They want to be able to see. Um, uh, their objects show up in in different areas, like on, in, in some ways, different machines. The problem with different machines and islands of storage is, is that, that uh, nobody wants to manage that, right? 
Nobody wants to have six storage products in order to do the job. What we've tried to do with the FS1 is to build data, uh, to build um, uh, domains, storage domains, which allow uh, users to essentially customers to encapsulate storage tiers within a domain and to um, essentially build a storage machine within a machine. So if, if you take virtualized storage today, in a sense, in my opinion, we've gone a little too far. Uh, we've, in most virtualized storage systems, which most are today, they, they uh, completely remove any knowledge of the physical locality of, the, of data within that system. And that means that if you have forensics to do or the accounting department wants their own set of assets, it's really hard to do. Black box. Yeah, and it's sort of like, well, it goes in and it comes out and it all intermingles. And what we decided was we can take it just a step backwards just a little bit and allow physical domains to exist, up to 64 of them in an FS1, allow those physical domains to exist such that different applications can build different resources around their needs. So there's disparate needs. There's archival needs, there's transaction processing, OLTP kind of environments, and you can see those as different machines within the FS1. And so that plays into this whole way that our database and, and its ADO and the various features and functions uh, that we use, big data, for example, needing archive, needing metadata on flash, the various tiers, the, the, the structure of the FS1 is built in order to solve disparate problems at the same time on one platform. So performance and management is the key things you're yeah, seeing. That. Yeah, it's, it's, thing. it's to be able to get some control over all of this stuff without having six different products, or 11 in an EMC's case. <laughs> so that brings the, the, the notion of quality of service then. That's exactly. something that when yeah. you were at Pillar, you guys really were focused on that. Yeah. Talking about quality of service, a lot of people talking about quality of service in, in the industry. Mm -hmm. it, it ties into the whole software defined meme. How should we be thinking about quality ser of service and how does it relate to the <laughs> container discussion? <laughs> I, I have to laugh a little bit, I apologize. <laughs> but when we in, uh, introduced quality of service into the industry in 2005, um, everybody <laughs> everybody pretty much you know, just panned it, said, oh, that's ridiculous, you know, who would want that? <laughs> and now everybody uh, uh, claims they have it. In fact, there's even people who claim that we, we, you know, others have false quality of service. Others like the people who invented it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I honestly, that, I mean, that's funny. So, <laughs> so our quality of service is critical because, and it's 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 very sensible because when you get up in the morning and and your plan was is to rake some leaves maybe before the sprinklers turned on, that may have been a good idea until as you were walking out of the house, you noticed that there was a broken water pipe. And when there's a broken water pipe, you have, probably have something more important to do. So when your your business is like that, right? First things first, you might might want to do web store where the revenue comes in before you do test and dev. You, you might want to prioritize that way, and that's what we do. We we make sense out of business priorities and align them with the way that the storage system performs. So its execution, its prioritization of its queues, they all align with the business priorities that you set for it the noisy neighbor problem in virtualized environments. Everybody knows uh, that one. And, and that comes from the fact that in most systems, there's no way to control some guy who's making a lot of requests and generating a lot of business for a storage system, but uh, he's not the most important guy. You can make right? a commercial out of that. Yeah. Everyone, everyone knows that. <laughs> you save 15% of performance. <laughs> nosy neighbor, everyone knows that. Did you know? Not nosy uh, neighbor. <laughs> the, uh, noisy neighbor. Noisy neighbor. <laughs> the, um, the nosy neighbor is another yeah, problem. Yeah, that is another issue. Right. That's, that's around security. That's a, man, that's a management issue. Yeah. Um, so anyway, QoS allows you to, to essentially align the way you want the storage system to align its, its execution and its resources against the way your business is, is and, structured. And I do that through software. You do it through right. a software management through. system, you set priorities, you say, I don't care, this guy's making all the noise, this guy's paying the bills, so I'm going to pay attention to him when he speaks. That, 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 does he pay the bills? <laughs> Some of them. Half of them. We spend the money. <laughs> we, we like to spend. Um, <laughs> the West Coast bills. So, <laughs> I pay Maddie, the East Coast bills. Maddie's, was ah. on, <laughs> Maddie's from, from IDC was on, he was saying, I see Moore's Law, you know, doubling performance, but the data growth has been significant. So, on the FS1, what is the big data piece of that, and can you, is anything new there, and give us an update on what's going on with the big data well, piece of it. Well, yeah, okay. Uh, uh, big data is an interesting beast because uh, it's a little bit like the cloud in the sense that no matter who you talk to, they kind of give you a different definition for what it is. Um, and that's okay, um, because there's a lot of different paradigms and environments where it applies or 
doesn't apply or mean something to one person and not another. Um, here's one of the saline attributes, low cost, because you're not storing petabytes of stuff at the price of flash, right? So what you'll see in the industry is in general, if somebody has an all flash array, they're not talking about big data. <laughs> because uh, you don't right. take, you know, an all flash array does not support two petabytes of, or three petabytes in the case of FS1, two node system Give alone. Give me some tape maybe. Right, <laughs> yeah, yeah, tape, <laughs> tape. So, um, but the FS1, unlike our competitors' all flash arrays, gives you the performance of flash, supports that fourth tier that gives you the dollars per terabyte that you need for big data. This is why I called it a chameleon when I first saw yeah, it. Yeah, and then okay. I, I love that actually. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure everyone understands that. It could be a bad thing in politics. Well, but uh, yeah, yeah, right, right. Well, we're not in politics. We're the storage though, thankfully. system. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But but the point is, you can you can make that system whatever you need it to be. Mm -hmm. Right. Deep and, and deep or high performance. But when you think about it, um, all the metadata in these systems, um, it all needs to be stored on something very quick. You need a fast access to index, and on petabytes mm. of, of of containers, that those those have big. There, there's a large amount of index data, right? And so what a better solution could you have than to have SSD uh, on one side, flash performance on one side, and have the, the giant low cost capacity containers on the other. Perfect. Will we ever have more metadata than data? <laughs> <laughs> Is that day going to hey. happen? Uh, well, <laughs> could, I, right? you know, I suppose you could. <laughs> <laughs> it is metadata. It's good yeah. news. Yeah. It's 200 metadata. words to describe uh, one. I wonder if we could talk about the competition a little bit. So you guys did a little smackdown at Oracle Open World. You took direct aim at, 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 at EMC and Extreme IO. Mm -hmm. um, what was that all about? I mean, you and I talked about this. You put forth some IOPS figures. Mm -hmm. I was asking you about latency. I was asking about all flash array. Where are we at in that whole urinary Olympics? <laughs> Well, look, it's real simple. I mean, we didn't, you know, we're, we weren't doing it to just uh, make noise. It, it's important that if you have an all flash array, you call it a flash storage system, it might be a, a valuable thing to not go out and compete against yesteryear's HDD centric design. I mean, if, <laughs> if that's what you do, everyone's going to go, and this is your flash array, right? Well, obviously, that wasn't the, the target. The target is to go out and compete head to head, which we do, with all flash arrays. EMC went and bought a solution, IBM went and bought a solution, right? HP went and bought a solution. It, people went out and bought solutions that were their performance solutions, right? So we compared ourselves against Extreme IO. What happened was, is that immediately EMC took all the data offline and said, oh, that's old data. It only been up for three weeks. <laughs> So you're talking about the, the, the data that you were attacking. Comparing against, something. yeah, and people yeah. complain, oh, there's fine print on the chart. Well, the fine print was a link to that data, which then when you went and got, went to it, you got a 404 error. <laughs> anyway, so, and that was just hours after Larry gave the pitch and did that comparison. Point is, we compared against people's most performance solutions. That's what we, we went and do. But the EMC guy said, well, that's not fair. <laughs> they so they did, said they did respond. Online, they, they said, uh -huh. well, that's not a fair comparison because you, you have HDD, well, but for performance, we'll compare against your best. For HDD, we'll compare against your best. So if you want a, a petabyte solution, VNX 8000 or whatever, we'll compare against that. It was a, it's a flash array, we're going to compare performance. We're, we're happy to compare against any metric that people want to look so at. So FS1, block-based storage, where, where are you competing with EMC? Is it, is it VMAX, is it, <laughs> is it VNX, is it Extreme IO, all of the above? What are your thoughts on VNX2? No, I mean, maybe you can talk yeah, about that. Thanks for that question, because the answer is, is that for people who are buying all flash arrays, they look at the FS1, we compete there. Uh, for people who are buying um, uh, general purpose arrays that need a little bit of flash and some disk, we compete with the FS1. We don't have six products or 11 products. We don't need them because we have a new architecture that allows you to express the performance of flash, the economics of disk on one platform under one management umbrella. We compete against uh, archive storage with just giant two petabytes of relatively slow disk. It's, it's an economical solution for, for customers and it has the same management interface, the same look. VNX2, um, it's VNX2, I mean it's... <laughs> You change the Chrome. It's still got two operating systems. It's still it's still got Windows in it and Dart from Solera. It's still all these different things to, to do different solutions kind of bolted together. That's what we we're trying to get away with. So you guys are going to basically have a, a block platform and a file platform and, and, and extend those lines. You don't see having, I mean, Joe Tucci says it's better to have, have, have overlaps than gaps. Right. Okay, that's kind of how he answers that you know, stovepipe question. 
but you feel as though you can address that market. And we've seen NetApp having mm -hmm. to you know, diverge from its single OS strategy. Yeah. Do you guys feel like those two are going to allow you to cover the TAM? I think so, and, and, and considering that both are uh, unified, uh, in other words, uh, you can do NAS with the FS1 and, and SAN with the ZS system. And uh, wh what, we, what we view is, is that you've got a platform that does one as its principal use in the data center. Our core SAN offering is the FS1. Our core NAS offering is the ZS system. Um, the reason is the architectures are different. They have different fundamental topologies and architectures to support the different requirements of, of file versus block, okay? And, and I, I think that that's a good choice. That's not to say you can't do NAS with the FS1. You can, it has its own filing system. Uh, it, it's not ZS inside. Right. It's built in natively on top of the structure of, of the software that, the F, that makes up the FS1. The same is true with ZS. It can do um, SAN. Uh, it has different kind of attributes and characteristics than the FS1, which don't make it quite as well suited for SAN as the FS1 but it can do it, so if you have a little bit of SAN in a NAS environment, you can do that. What do you think of the, uh, the so flash? So no gap. Okay, all right, fair enough. What do you think about the flash startups? You're out here in Silicon Valley, John, you are as well. You've seen crazy valuations, uh, but it, sometimes <laughs> crazy valuations turn into big exits, but David Scott said in theCUBE to us, he doesn't feel as though the flash startups will be able to get escape velocity because IBM's made a choice, you guys haven't had to buy, you know, HP's got you know, the three par, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. EMC with Extreme IO, that the, the startups won't be able to get escape velocity. You buy that? I mean, I know Pure doesn't buy that. What do you think? Well, <laughs> he wouldn't expect them to Scott buy that. Scott Deason's not going to agree with that statement. No, but, uh, uh, and, and I have to agree with him. I mean, frankly, the problem is, is that everybody, look, you're either going to go public or you're going to get bought. There's no one, no one to buy you now. I mean, everybody's sort of made their play, right? So uh, they've done that, and now you have to go public. The problem with going public with an all-flash array that, that isn't a mainstream solution is that everybody else covers that in one way or another and has no gaps and can do everything with their solution, meet you head-on for performance, and so your differentiators are disappearing the bigger sales every, force. every day. Yeah. It's a tough market. We got a break there. Larry Ellison's about to come on stage. We're getting the hook. This is theCUBE live <laughs> here at Silicon Valley. Mike Workman, Senior Vice President, Oracle Storage. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We'll be right back. Thank you. <laughs>